Um, to start with, uh, right off the bat, uh, let's start with anterior temporal lobectomy. Um, this is the standard operation that I learned uh, when I was a fellow uh, at uh, Yale University with Dr. Dennis Spencer, towering figure in our field. Um, and uh, this is one approach that, that he developed uh, and published on first in the 1980s. Um, and uh, it involves uh, removing, I'll get my pointer going here, uh, um, a, a lateral portion of the anterior medial temporal lobe to gain access uh, to remove the medial structures uh, seen here as uh, uh, the hippocampus, anterior going to posterior, and this basal temporal region as well, and ultimately delivering an end block specimen typically measuring around four centimeters in, in length. And you see the, def the uh, defect over here. Uh, the standard temporal lobectomy involves uh, removing several structures. <clears throat> um, the anterior temporal lobe, again, is for access to the medial temporal structures, including the uncus, the hippocampus, parahippocampal gyrus, and amygdala. Uh, and typically is done through an incision. That's a small uh, question mark uh, incision. Um, uh, preserving as much of the temporal muscle as possible. So what are the outcomes that we expect from that uh, operation in terms of seizure outcome and as importantly, cognitive outcomes because all of the things we do in medicine are involve uh, risk and benefit and we are doing our best to help patients uh, while doing our best to hurt them as little as possible. Um, and in fact, ATL is highly effective. Uh, and this was demonstrated in uh, uh, one of the few randomized clinical trials that we have um, in this area. And one of the earliest clinical trials in neurosurgery uh, carried off by Sam Weeb, a neurologist uh, then at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. Uh, and he was able to do a randomized tr control trial of best medical therapy uh, against surgical treatment and found uh, that after one year, uh, the surgical group had a 58% seizure-free rate um, as compared to 8% in the medical group. And in fact, the surgical group was a bit higher because this was what's called an intent to treat analysis that some of you may be familiar with, such that all patients assigned to the surgical group remained in the surgical group, whether they had surgery or not. And I believe it was four patients did not have surgery for one reason or another and are counted as not being seizure free. If you look at the patients that actually had surgery, um, then 64% of patients were seizure free. And uh, it's important to also note uh, that in this group, um, about 70% of patients had hippocampal sclerosis, which is well known to do better in surgical treatments uh, as compared to uh, patients without hippocampal sclerosis. So we'd expect for a pure HS category of patients or mesial temporal sclerosis, MTS group, uh, they might do even better. And for the patients that did not have MTS, they might do a little bit worse. So um, this has been uh, um, also studied in non-randomized uh, trials, uh, and in this nice review by McIntosh, there are 325 patients. You see approximately similar results, although this is uh, out to 10 years, and you can see a fall off of effectiveness as we get out to 10 years, five years, and 10 years, which is unfortunate, and we're always struggling as to what to do with these patients. There's also an improvement in quality of life that goes along with this, as you can imagine. So the advantages of standard ATL, as I just described it, uh, are that we have the greatest evidence of benefit, in fact, class one evidence. Uh, and in fact, there was a second clinical trial uh, called the uh, ERSET trial. It was an NIH sponsored randomized clinical trial of early resective uh, surgery for epilepsy. Uh, done within the first two years of intractability. And unfortunately, that trial was unable to be completed because of lack of enrollment, because patients who presented to surgical centers for surgery, uh, in fact, want to have surgery. Uh, and so they were unwilling to be randomized to a treatment 
that would continue medical therapy for a year. Um, and so that closed, but did show approximately the same amount of effectiveness in the group of, uh, I believe it was 15 patients uh, that were uh, um, treated. ATL also potentially treats lateral and basal neocortical foci, although, as I noted, the lateral and basal approach is specifically for access to the mesial temporal structures. And there can be perioperative complications. So an NIH consensus statement uh, had about 5% or so morbidity and mortality, although mortality is extremely rare in this surgery. Uh, most large series do not report surgical complications, uh, but the randomized controlled trials did. Uh, and they included a thalamic infarct, which is uh, an important and unfortunate adverse effect um, for when we hit the anterior choroidal artery, um, one wound infection, and some verbal memory decline. Interestingly, only two patients reporting verbal memory decline uh, in the Weeb trial. And in the Engel trial, uh, which is the latter one I reported to you, um, there were three ischemic changes with one infarct um, and um, um, some other rare complications. So generally a well-tolerated surgery. Um, some of the issues though, and this is not reported as a complication are that uh, Myers loop that you all know about the um, optic radiation as it projects anteriorly into the temporal lobe um, is expected to be countered, encountered uh, in this surgery and leads to a pie in the sky um, uh, visual field deficit that we consider part and parcel uh, to doing this surgery. But also notably, <clears throat> we can have adverse effects from operating on the anterior temporal lobe. The reason that um, Dennis Spencer uh, limited the operation to 3.5 centimeters from the temporal tip is that um, there can be language functions in the temporal lobe. And this study by uh, Marla Ham Hamburger uh, at Columbia um, shows that uh, visual uh, naming is found in the typical posterior lateral region and mid-temporal region, uh, but auditory naming can be found even out to the temporal pole. And so this can be encountered and I will discuss this in short order. So this is one of the reasons why uh, um, surgeons have sought a different approach uh, to this operation. Uh, for one, uh, is uh, uh, in particular, George Ogeman has been, uh, um, who's of course retired now, um, a, a real proponent of the tailored anterior temporal lobe resection with mapping so that all patients getting left temporal or dominant hemisphere uh, temporal surgery are done awake uh, and uh, stimulation mapping is applied to the temporal lobe to define that area that is safe uh, to, to uh, transgress. Um, and uh, that helps to avoid uh, damage to those areas I showed on the last slide. But also another trend has been uh, towards se more selective operations. Uh, we call these selective amygdala hippocampectomies. Uh, and these involve approaches that go through the brain through corridors uh, that are thought to be less um, harmful than those uh, that uh, um, involve resection. So there's various different corridors that uh, can be uh, considered in, in doing this. This was originally um, proposed by Niemeyer in 1956, who performed a transcortical selective amygdala hippocampectomy, um, and then eventually by Yazergill, uh, whom you all know, uh, who proposed the transylvian approach, um, uh, which uh, transgresses the temporal stem, but has the potential when kept very anterior to avoid that. And so this evolution is shown here from the original two-third temporal lobectomy, which I didn't talk about even, which goes as far back as seven centimeters. And of course, on the dominant side is associated with significant language disruption to the temporal pole <clears throat> resection. This is the operation that Spencer does to this more sparing selective amygdala hippocampectomy. And then I'll eventually show you how we eventually move to MR-guided laser interstitial therapy for a so-called super selective approach. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.